The SpaceX Starship, proposed by Elon Musk, has been promised to be one of the largest, most powerful rockets in human history. Bold claim. But the larger and more powerful the craft, the more fuel it is going to require to speed up on departure and slow down upon arrival. As it turns out, this vehicle as designed is incapable of lifting the fuel it requires to complete any mission other than orbital delivery, so any other mission profiles will have to rely on orbital refueling. In fact, SpaceX and NASA both claim that orbital refueling and refuel depots of various descriptions are pivotal to human exploration of deep space, even though the technology presently does not exist. SpaceX's mission concept is that Starship would be launched atop a booster called Super Heavy, then separate from its booster to climb to LEO, where a series of fuel tankers would line up to mate with the outbound ship in a tail-to-tail -tail configuration. One by one, they would dump their fuel loads into Starship's aft until her tanks are full, and then the Mars-bound vessel can start its 35 million mile journey. It's an intriguing idea, launching a vehicle into orbit that is incapable of conducting its mission without receiving external supplies. So let's see what their plan is, and whether or not the concept passes muster. Whenever possible, we are going to use data straight from SpaceX and Musk presentations, so there will be no debate as to the source of the information. According to the Mars Transportation Architecture Plan on SpaceX.com, the plan is to launch Starship and have it intercepted in orbit by no less than four refueling tankers, although other reports often use five or six as the number. We are actually going to use six, for good reasons we will explain shortly. But first, let's nail down the numbers for the vehicle components using information from the SpaceX website. The Starship itself is a second stage when it launches into LEO atop the Super Heavy booster. As stated, the Starship tanks hold a combined total of 1,200 tons of methane and liquid oxygen as propellant. Below that, the vehicle payload capacity is reported to be 100 tons. The Super Heavy first stage booster has a stated propellant capacity of 3,400 tons. This is the fuel it carries on board not only to launch, but also to propulsively land back on Earth to be used again. To get Starship into orbit, the vehicle launches with the second stage mounted to the top of the first. Starship cannot reach LEO without the Super Heavy booster. Once the fuel in the first stage is cut off, the two stages separate and the booster returns to Earth for a propulsive upright landing using its fuel in reserve in the remaining header tanks. Starship then ignites its other engines to continue climbing and maintain orbital velocity in LEO. We surmise that the craft would use and should not use any more than half of the fuel it has on board. That means it takes around 4,000 tons of methane and liquid oxygen to get 100 tons of payload into orbit, leaving half the fuel in Starship tanks. Now it's time for the tankers to launch. And each time they do, they will expend the same energy as the first vehicle, except their payload will be fuel instead of cargo or crew. The booster will again use 3,400 tons of propellant, and the Starship tanker will use fuel in its tanks to catch up with, and to mate with, the Starship while it pilots in reverse. Then that tanker will have to use more fuel to return to Earth and land to repeat until refueling is done. So how much fuel are they likely to deliver each trip? The rated payload capacity of Starship is stated right on the SpaceX website, only 100 tons. And if the Starship tanks are down to 600 tons, well there's the six trips we mentioned earlier on the transportation architecture slide. As a side note, there are some people who believe Starship is also going to replace international air travel on Earth, so let's nip that in the bud right now while we're here. On top of all the logistical nightmares that would accompany such a proposal, the fuel bill on the Starship is quite frankly ridiculous. For a single Starship launch worth of fuel that would carry 100 passengers, you can fly a Boeing 747 with a passenger capacity of 416 persons for 450 hours, and you don't have to make the guests buy custom tailored flight suits. That's just for the Starship launch. The total propellant required to refuel the Starship in orbit adds up very quickly to 31,600 tons of fuel required to obtain a fully fueled Starship ready for its trek to Mars. That's a 53 to 1 ratio going the wrong way. The SpaceX presentation slides on this topic are quite misleading actually. They show the two vehicles mated tail to tail with the tanker having full propellant tanks 
and the Starship having empty propellant tanks in the beginning and exchanging a full fuel load between the two in a single action. In fact, both vehicles should have a similar fuel load on board. Why would one be full and the other empty if they both got to orbit using the same system? In this simulation description, while the two are connected tail to tail, Starship somehow slows its velocity enough while in orbit to cause the fuel in the tanker to flood forward into the Starship holds, which is a neat trick since both vehicles' main engines are being blocked by the other vehicle, leaving only small maneuvering thrusters in the nose to possibly force the ship backwards hard enough to cause the payload to slosh forward. Which brings up a point to quickly touch on. Vehicles in LEO have a mean orbital velocity of about 17,000 miles per hour or 28,000 kilometers per hour. If the vehicle slows down significantly, its orbit will degrade. Just as if it speeds up, it will climb further away from Earth into a higher orbit until it leaves LEO. How do they expect to slam on the brakes and maintain their velocity and orbit? It actually doesn't seem to be a very feasible concept at all especially since the fuel they would be transferring would be in the payload compartment, not the main propellant tanks as shown in the demonstration slides. Also, the fuel is being chilled and kept under pressure to keep it liquid. And when one pressurized vessel is connected to another, once the valves open, both vessels will equalize to the same pressure in the combined system. All the pressure does not run from one container to the next. Ironically, we can show you what fuel floating around in a weightless fuel tank looks like, courtesy of the SpaceX CR5 LOX camera. See, most large tanks made for hauling liquids contain baffles to minimize slosh in the tank while in motion. This includes most other spacefaring vehicles. For example, the large lightweight external tank on the space shuttle, a vessel similar in diameter to Super Heavy, had anti-slosh baffles. So does the Saturn V launch booster. These are meant to prevent the liquids from relocating in the tank quicker than the control systems on the rocket can compensate for the motion of the liquid as it affects the center of gravity on the craft. Musk is continuously going on and on about how the Starship program is going to take full advantage of rapidly reusable rockets, but there's definitely a bit of a gap in the logic. First, if the Starship itself is going to be going to Mars, and staying with the people that brought there, that's not a reusable craft. Second, if he's under the impression that his refueling system is going to work the way he presents it during his unveilings, he's completely unaware of spaceflight industry incident rates and ignoring his own company's rocket recovery record, which has had 10 failures and 65 attempts, two of which were in the spring of 2020. This still frame from their launch video shows how SpaceX intends to land Super Heavy, one of the largest boosters ever made, right back onto its own landing mounts, while a fully fueled tanker sits just a couple hundred yards away. This super heavy vehicle, if it doesn't come in perfectly every time, could take out that entire facility. So when the inevitable happens, and this machine explodes on the pad, how bad is it going to be? Since we don't know how much fuel will still be on board when it lands, we'll run the numbers as if the vehicle explodes on the launch pad during a takeoff, and that'll cover both scenarios. The Starship carries 1,200 tons of propellant. The Super Heavy carries another 3,400 tons. A tanker would have another 100 tons in the payload compartment, but we'll run this as if it's a crewed mission. And then, we're going to compare the results against the nuclear bomb that took out Hiroshima. 4,600 tons of propellant is 4.6 million kilos. According to EPA.gov, 4.6 million kilos of methane contains 255 billion BTUs of energy. 255 billion BTUs equates to 64 kilotons of TNT. And the nuclear bomb that wiped Hiroshima off the map was a 15 kiloton device. So, super heavy, fully loaded with the Starship, is equal in potential energy to about four Hiroshima's. There's a really neat feature on the website nuclearsecrecy.com and it allows you to pick a city, pick a weapons yield in kilotons, and see what the blast radius of any side strike would be. Now this is meant for nuclear explosions, but that's the type of energy we're dealing with, so fireballs and blast radius would be similar. Let's pick on Washington DC, because everybody seems to these days. 
64 kiloton yield will drop it right on the National Mall. Here's what it would look like with 103,000 dead. Another favorite target in movies is New York, specifically Manhattan. Boom, 320,000 dead and the south end of the island is leveled. How about a launch in Boca Chica, Texas, where the Starship facility is actually located? Well, that would wipe out the entire production facility, Boca Chica Village, the nature sanctuary to the south, and the seaside state park. And of course, with rockets, it's never if one of them is going to blow up, it's a matter of when. One more thing before we sign off, since we've got some time. We've been using these frames directly from the SpaceX site, and we thought it was worth noting that these are supposedly to scale. See that little fella in the lower left of the panel? That is supposed to represent an adult male, presumably about six feet tall. But the declared width of the Starship is 30 feet wide, which means if we stood five of this figure on top of each other, that should be 30 feet. Except you can easily fit eight of these guys in between the sidewalls, even when you leave extra space to stand them up straight. So either the craft is 48 feet wide on that scale, or the person is supposed to represent a child about three foot nine. It just shows how much attention to detail the designers are actually putting into these presentation slides. But we work with what we're given, so we're gonna fix it for them. Here's how tall the figures should have been. Let's put the efficiency of this entire refueling concept into terms that is dead easy to understand. If the trucking industry worked on this same premise, the driver of this truck would be using everything in the big tank to deliver the contents of the small one. It's an incredibly inefficient system, and it cannot possibly offer a cost savings in the end, which bites deeply into the claims made by Musk that he will be able to drastically reduce his cost per pound launched into orbit, which is currently quoted by NASA at $10,000 per pound. Space launches are costly enough without multiplying the cost and risk of launches by a factor of seven. As we continue to present these videos, let us know in the comments if there are any other topics you would like us to take on, and we'll do our best to get to your suggestions. Thank you for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. If you'd like to be notified when our next episode is posted, just hit subscribe.